Well, it's my pleasure to introduce Nima Tuzade uh, to the DBMI seminar. So Dr. Tuzade is uh, currently an assistant professor in the Department of Biomedical Engineering and Department of Medicine at the University of Arizona, where he studies wearable sensor technology in a hospital setting. Uh, so we had a really nice conversation this morning. Um, he brings a really interesting approach to studying human dis diseases directly in the patient environment. Uh, he's also been really productive uh, with over 100 published papers and conference proceedings. Uh, he's completed over 17 clinical studies and has mentored dozens of graduate and undergraduate st uh, students. Uh, he's also a PI in a bunch of NIH grants. Um, so prior to becoming an, an assistant professor, he received his bachelor's in mechanical engineering from Amir Kabir, University of Technology in Iran, a master's in biomedical engineering uh, with a focus on biomechanics from Iran University of Science, and he also received his PhD from Virginia Tech in industrial and systems engineering. Uh, he performed a biomedical engineering postdoc at the University of Arizona, uh, where he later became an aging and cognition fellow at the Healthy Brain Research Center at the CDC. Um, so Nima, um, excited to learn more about your current work. Please take it away. Awesome, thank you so much, Greg, for the introduction. Um, so can, I, I hope the, it's good and everyone can hear me good. So um, I'm gonna skip this first uh, slide because uh, Greg did a great job of introducing me. Um, just a quick uh, background about myself. My education is the, in the field of mechanical engineering and biomedical engineering. And since I joined University of Arizona, uh, I was fortunate to start in the Department of Surgery, College of Medicine. Um, uh, that was a good uh, environment to get exposed to the clinical side of the studies and um, build collaboration with medical doctors. We're doing um, engineering uh, um, research in the field of human movement programming and wearable sensor technology, but we're more leaning towards more uh, applied uh, research, uh, basically defined problems by the medical side. So that was a very good exposure for me. Um, uh, I tried to highlight some keywords related to my research, um, but I promise I'm not going to go through all of this because it will take a long time. Uh, I, I'm focusing on uh, some research that is related to frailty and cognitive assessment in older adults, and eventually I will talk about fall rehabilitation if we have if we have time. I just wanted to highlight some um, keywords related to my research and, and if there are any questions about them. So um, uh, the mission of my lab is to uh, basically use biomechanical approaches, wearable sensor technology, and more recently machine learning approaches to diagnose and treat older adults with uh, aging-related condition and uh, syndromes. We are mainly focusing on frailty and function in older adults. That's going to be the first topic of my talk. And then uh, also we work in the area of fall rehabilitation. So. Um, before I get started, I would just like to quickly have an overview of what the problem is, what frailty is. Um, frailty is a geriatric syndrome. It's the lack of physiological reserve happen to people uh, after age of usually 65 or 70 years old. There's some underlying mechanism leading to frailty, such as inflammation, um, the elevated uh, ILC, C per C reactive protein. There's some uh, metab metabolic deficiencies. Uh, that arise from deficiencies in mitochondria subunits. And then um, there are also some hormonal derangement, especially cortisol and testosterone. All of these would change the state of a uh, person from a more anabolic to a catabolic state, which means that they would have a less exercise tolerance, low energy level, and uh, basically a lack of muscle performance or defined by the term of dynopenia. So, but what we care here about is to um, basically detect those symptoms, which is uh, muscle loss and weakness and slowness. So that's the main focus of the frailty assessment. Um, it's very prevalent. You can see the intermediate stage of frailty, which is called pre-frailty, can be as high as 44% in community. And of course, as people get older and develop different comorbidities, these percentages can go up. It's way higher for those with uh, congestive heart failure or those with COPD. So it's very prevalent. And you this cycle basically very nicely or organized what happened to people when they develop frailty. 
The main reason is sarcopenia, which eventually lead to lack of strength that can show up in walking performance, in performing daily activity. Then eventually in extreme cases, it would lead to disability and dependency of these people. Um, why is it important to understand frailty? So it's the best way to risk stratify older adults. Um, when it comes to clinical decision-making about uh, if the person can go through invasive therapy, if they need to stay longer in a hospital to fully recover and uh, identifying what are the chances for the person to get readmitted to the hospital. All of this uh, answer to this question goes back to the state of the person, if they're frail or not. So when people become frail, uh, it would be difficult for them to bounce back to the normal baseline position when some stress happens. So we all go through different sickness or events uh, and then we recover. But as we lose our physiological reserve, that recovery process is not happening uh, adequately. Uh, so the best example of this event can be a simple fall event that can be very dramatic for older adults. Uh, it can be actually through, through this recent years, we realized how important to, is to measure frailty because of the pandemic to be able to predict what's gonna to happen to the patient. For example, if they can go through the ventilation pro process or uh, what are the chances of the mortality? So it's a very big question to answer in the clinical setting. Uh, these are some numbers to summarize. What are, the, what, what are the numbers showing in terms of the expenditure for those who are frail and compared to the normal people? Um, this is both reported for female and male and you see more than four times of healthcare expenditure is allocated for those who are developing frailty. And also, as I mentioned before, the chances of having frailty for those who are developing comorbid condition like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, disease is twice as much. For heart disease patient, um, the rate of mortality and readmission is uh, 1.5 or more for those who are frail. So all of these telling us it's, it's a critical point to be able to measure frailty. So how we do it, uh, there are two main common ways to measure frailty. One is the freed frailty kind of phenotype that I try to summarize it in this picture that um, there are several different measures that they take for this assessment, uh, like grip strength, the walking speed and low physical activity that is questionnaire and also weight loss and exhaustion. These are all come out as a um, questionnaire that the participants need to do. Based on that, they can say if the person is non-frail, pre-frail, and for how many of these five categories there are have deficiencies. So it takes 45 minutes to do this test. And the other famous way to measure frailty is a questionnaire that contains 72 questions uh, developed by Rockwood. Um, uh, this is subjective and basically interpreting all the questions and answers, it takes a lot of expertise and time to perform. So if you want to summarize these, these are uh, some papers that I got recently, and they're trying to highlight why uh, frailty is not, they're not being used in the clinical setting. It's been defined, they use it in research purposes, but um, where it's needed, which is the clinical setting, uh, the, the, there's so many limitations to use it. Uh, because as I said, it's hard to ask those questions and if you think about the free test that it requires walking, a lot of patients are in the bed when they're admitted to the hospital and they're not able to perform a walking test or even simple tests of the grip of strength. So that's, I think, when the engineering comes along to help with this process. We have all the technology now that can uh, help us to come up with some measurements. So the goal of these, uh, uh, this program research is to develop a method that is objective, quick, and accurate that we can use it in the clinical setting. Uh, but our main focus is to be able to come up with a tool that eventually can be used in the clinic. So um, the first thing we talk about the frailty is the lack of muscle performance. So there's several aspects we're targeting within this test. And of course, the first one is the neuromuscular performance. There is a concept of aging muscle. We lose muscle, which is defined by sarcopenia and aging mitochondria. So the performance of the muscle is also dropped, which is defined by dynopenia. Again, several different factors can lead to that, like inflammation, metabolic deficiencies, and hormonal changes. So it's important to measure that. 
how we doing it, this uh, assessment is based on upper extremity. So this is a test actually we do. What we say, what we ask the participant to do is to rapidly move the elbow for 20 seconds as fast as they can. They can do it in the bed. And while they do the test, we have the motion sensor attached to them that can give us information about their different features of frailty, such as slowness, weakness, exhaustion, and how much flexible they are. All of these parameters can be achieved using a gyroscope sensor, basically motion sensor attached to the participant. So we tested this. Um, we collected data from uh, almost four, 500 participants now, and we saw a very good correlation and association between our tests and the gold standard that are out there, such as the free test and the frailty index that I was talking about. But what we're really interested in is to see the score we're developing now is um, associated with adverse outcomes. So we did some longitudinal study to see what happened to these participants after they're doing this test. And we saw that the score is different, significantly different in predicting discharge outcomes. If the person can go home or they need to go to nursing home, it was predicted for a 30 day readmission. And you can see not, the score is different. Um, green is those without adverse outcome and red is those with adverse, with adverse outcome. And several features we get for this score is also different between these two groups. <clears throat> uh, it's also interesting to see that um, age by itself might not be the best indicator of who would uh, have this adverse outcome. So you can see in this uh, study, we uh, collected data from 100 participants. The age is pretty much similar, but the score that they get from the physical function is different for these two, part two, for these two groups. But you want to dig further. We want to really come up with more accurate way to measure muscle performance. So this has been done through an uh, NIH grant and the targeted population for this study was older adults with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. And the reason is that they share several similar factors. They both happen in old age, um, weight loss, inflammation, lack of muscle strength. They're common between COPD and frailty. Uh, and because we're focusing on sarcopenia and lack, lack of muscle uh, performance, we targeted this population. So what we did with the same scenario that we did the test, the same motion sensor, we tried to develop a muscle model. So we consider a subject, a specific muscle model. We get some anthropometry information from the subject. And this model has seven different muscles. Uh, so we can calculate the muscle performance for each individual muscle. But uh, what was unique about this approach, um, we tried to use the EMG assisted optimization. So of course we have seven muscle and this is an indeterminate problem. So we have to do some optimization. Uh, in the topic of motor control is optimum to have minimum muscle activity while the stability of the joint, which is the elbow joint here is maintained. So with this approach, we take into account of both factors to have a minimum activity and at the same time have a good correlation with what we get from the actual activity of the muscle that we get from the EMG data. So it was interesting to see these parameters even more different compared to just the activity level, which means that we're not only looking at how much the activity is and how, but also how efficiently the person doing the task. It's a simple task of elbow flexion, but the level of coactivity you can see is much higher for those who are having COPD compared to cognitively normal people. So um, we have a, a huge data set now, uh, more than a thousand older adults recruited that they just did this test. We have cross-sectional re results compared to gold standard, and we have some longitudinal outcome. Uh, what we're doing so far is to extract features. So I try to summarize the features that we extract here, but there's a lot more we can do. And um, that's the basically the next step of this research to use this uh, sim simpler machine learning approaches. And more interestingly, to look at the raw data and use uh, some deep learning approaches to see how we can correlate the signal we get uh, from motion sensor, from the EMG signal, how we can correlate this with this outcome. So this is going to be the next step of this project.
So I talked about neuromuscular performance. The cognitive function is also a huge factor in frailty. The concept of cognitive fra frailty drawn more attention. There are studies show that if you measure cognition at the same time, it's the, the score we develop will be more predictive of outcome. And of course, again, there are so many underlying uh, uh, features that basically can cause these cognitive function deficits, like inflammation, depression, lack of muscle uh, strength, and several comorbid, comorbid, comorbid conditions, such as cardiovascular disease uh, or COPD that I was talking about. So how we go about to measure cognition is based on the, the concept of dual tasking, a simultaneous performance of a motor task and a cognitive task. But what we're doing here is to measure how accurately the person is performing, performing the motor task. So the hypothesis is that when person is developing cognitive impairment, there's gonna be some compensatory process in the brain. And because of that, the performance is gonna drop. So the simplest example is someone talking to the phone and just so they're walking and then suddenly the phone calls. They can pick up the phone, continue the conversation. and with no changes in the walking speed, continue doing that. But a person, the same scenario, if they have cognitive impairment, they would have to slow down or at some point stop to be able to accomplish the cognitive task. And that changes in the motor function is what we're looking for. They've done this for the gait test and they saw they can predict um, Alzheimer's disease and even myocognitive impairment. What we are trying to do now is to implement this for the upper extremity test that I was explaining. There are some advantages because if we do this with gait test, some postural balance deficits and lack of strength in lower extremity can influence the uh, performance. But when the person is in the bed, we purely measure performance just based on their strength and their cognitive impairment. So for this test, all we ask the participants to do an elbow flexion for 60 seconds and as consistently as they can. <clears throat> and meanwhile, they're doing the test, they have to count numbers backward by three. We, are cho we choose this co cognitive task because it's highly associated with working memory, memory and executive functioning. So to develop the score, based on the speed and accuracy of motor task. And we com compare this with uh, common screening tools that are available in the clinical setting. So we saw a good, very good association between these the screening and what is available. So just for those who might not be familiar with this kind of screening, there's their subjective questionnaire. They usually take um, 10 to 15 minutes to uh, ask these questions. And they're targeting several different aspects of cognitive impairment, such as attention, visual spatial executive functioning, memory, and um, what we realize we can really get a very close core association between our score and these tests. So we got excited. We wanted to make sure this works. Uh, so we started a project uh, funded by NIH to um, really look at participants that have uh, diagnosed cognitive impairment. We are looking at amnestic cognitive impairment of the Alzheimer type and those who were at very early stage of developing Alzheimer disease. So this graph shows what we get and what I'm talking about, about like uh, the motor of task uh, speed and accuracy. So these are three people the same age and um, with different uh, uh, cognitive status. And you see how the variability and the performance drops as the person is developing cognitive impairment. These are all performing a dual task. So we can simply look at the maximums and do a coefficient of variation and come up with some measure of uh, the accuracy of motor performance. But we want to dig more and see what, what else is out there. So we saw that these parameters are significantly different between the groups. Um, and uh, what we wanted to see if, uh, if we can look more deeper and see how the trajectory of motion would change when the person is performing this dual tasking. So um, we implemented the concept of nonlinear analysis. This has been used in different fields, but this is the first time we're using it for assessing cognitive impairment um, with this, uh, with this uh, scenario. Uh, what we are doing, um, when the person is performing a task, we ask them to do elbow flexion as consistently as they can. 
they try to develop a trajectory of motion in their brain. If we somehow disturb the, the brain, then the, there would be some changes in their performance. So this is a healthy person. In the middle of the picture, you can see how the, the trajectory of motion is changed when they're counting by one. We made the task more difficult counting by three, and then it's kind of completely disturbed. Um, so we, there are different approaches. What, what we are doing here is to do a state space reconstruction. Uh, we look at the time series with different delay and plot it with respect to itself. And then uh, we look at how these neighborhoods are diverse through time, uh, which is basically count, count as the Lyapunov exponent. And we see how that... Uh, that uh, parameter that we're extracting is different between three different groups. We saw that, yes, we can see the trend that it's going from cognitively impaired to Alzheimer's disease. There is a trend of change in this, uh, uh, in these participants, but um, as you can see, the, we are more interested in early stage detection of cognitive impairment. And uh, those would people that is highlighted in yellow and having mild cognitive impairment. So we try to use other approaches. So we use the entropy analysis. We, for with this approach, we look at the complexity of the signal. So um, the concept is that if we see a trend in the signal, then the chances of seeing this trend in future behavior. So that means that if the signal is purely re repetitive, we get an entropy close to zero. If it's purely chaotic, like white noise, you get something close to one. So we employ, employed this approach and we saw now we can see differences between mild cognitively impaired and cognitively normal. And you can see it's interesting to see the highlight that these differences would be more highlighted when the person is performing dual tasks compared to doing normal single task. So this was promising. We could improve the accuracy of prediction of cognitive impairment, impairment by 10% because we look at the whole signal, not just the peaks. Um, but for the next phase of this project, all of what we've done so far was basically looking at, looking at the motor function. We want to see what's going on in the brain. We we're curious to see if the person is doing this task, what's going on in the brain. But the only solution for that is to do the brain imaging. Uh, it was a diff difficult and expensive at the same time uh, project to do this in the fMRI. Um, any, I think that's the story for any task-based fMRI study that there's a lot of uh, missing data because of the motion artifacts. Uh, but we started this project. So there were three main goals that we were trying to achieve. Uh, first of all, to see how the brain function changes in terms of the complexity um, for different age. And if we can see differences between mild cognitively impaired and cognitively normal participants. And uh, also what, kind, what brain regions would be affected by this dual tasking? Um, so I know it's a very busy slide, but this shows the process. So um, the person would be in the fMRI setting. We try to constrain the head that it's limited motion and they have to do counting, friction and dual tasks. And this has to be repeated uh, two in one trials and then four trials. So we did the normal pre-processing to get the images ready, like get rid of non-brain tissue, do the slice timing, do the either, all the frequency adjustment that I have to do. And the last line shows what we did at, in, in addition. Uh, we did our own MATLAB code to do all this post-processing. We eventually um, measure the complexity of the brain function. So it's very similar to the entropy that I was explaining, but here, because we don't know really what's the uh, there's no such repetitive motion such as what we did for the arm test. So we don't know how the re what basically time delay we consider for those repetition. We don't know what's going on in the hemodynamic brain response. So that's why we did this uh, uh, multi-scale entropy to get rid of those uh, confounding variables. Um, what I try to summarize here is um, there's a significant drop in the com complexity of the brain function as people get older. So this is a very small sample size, but you can see how nicely there's a trend between age and this MSC score. And it's uh, basically, you can see it in several different regions of the brain. 
we also observed that the complexity behavior during this dual tasking test uh, is uh, up to 35% different. Uh, for is 35% lower for those who are developing cognitive impairment compared to those who are cognitively normal. So these are very promising results. And we saw that really we can detect some differences in brain function when they do the dual task. But more importantly, we saw that using these two module um, assessment tool, looking at both motor function and the brain function at the same time, we can improve our prediction of cognitive impairment by 30%. Uh, and we saw that mainly cortical part of the brain would affect it by this task, which actually opened up a new avenue for research for us because as I mentioned, fMRI is expensive. There's a lot of chance that you lose data because of motion artifact, but then the new technologies are out there. So we use the functional uh, near infrared spectroscopy, which is FNIRS. Um, with this device, you can measure oxygenation and then the oxygenation changes in brain activity. And it runs completely wireless with Bluetooth. Um, withhold with this setup, we can minimize the motion artifact. And uh, the whole preparation time, it takes five minutes. So it's very uh, good opportunity to be able to do this testing in the clinical setting. Because what we do, we take the, all this equipment to the patient's room instead of asking them to come to the clinic. So that would be advantageous to you. So this um, video shows uh, like the whole process of what's going to happen to the participant. And then again, the good thing about this is that you can in real time see uh, the activity of different channels. And if there's something wrong, of course, you can fix it. So um, initially, we wanted to see, um, we do this test, how and to what extent we can um, basically change the brain function when we apply our uh, dual tasking. So you can see that there is a lot of changes in the complexity of the brain signal when they're doing the, uh, the counting, which is a cognitive task, and especially it gets worse when they do the dual tasking. These are results from healthy subject. And we saw that there was a significant effect on the left pre and post central temporal and frontal part of the brain, uh, which was pr promising. So now we can move forward and test this on patients. Um, so we recruited healthy young, um, older adults that are cognitively healthy and cognitively impaired older adults at different stage of mild and being Alzheimer's disease. But these are patients that are early stage because um, if they're progressed AD, then um, they would be difficult for them to participate in this study. And at the same time, there's no point. We want to capture these differences in the early stage. Uh, for both the uh, prevention uh, methodology and also because cognitive frailty is very similar to mild cognitive impairment that we are assessing here. So uh, what I want to highlight in this uh, slide is that um, there's a lot of research going on to look at um, brain complexity, but what is unique about our test is um, we expose participants to a stress test. I try to call it the stress test. So we, um, they, they actually have to do this cognitive dual tasking. And when they get exposed to this condition, some changes that might not be obvious during resting start to show up. We saw there's no differences in the brain function and complexity when they're resting, but when they do the dual task, you could significantly see the significant difference between the cognitively normal and cognitively impaired older adults. So um, the last component of this uh, frailty assessment tool that we are going to I'm going to talk about is the cardiac autonomic control. Um, so we're looking at the impaired autonomic nervous system. There are, again, uh, several different features of frailty that can influence uh, the uh, autonomic nervous system, like the electrical conduction, changes in the act action potential, and even changes in the heart system uh, mechanism and contraction, because similar to the same way that the uh, frail participant lose their uh, skeletal muscle strength, the same scenario can happen for the heart muscle. The common way um, to measure heart rate, uh, uh, to, to measure the cardiac autonomic control is to look at heart rate when the person is resting. So that requires at least five minutes of measurement 
So then they look at the variability of heart rate when the person is just sitting down. Uh, what we trying to employ is to directly look how the heart rate changes because of the physical activity. Um, so first we employed the walking test. The participant is supposed to fall, walk 15 feet and we look at their heart rate. So what we observed was that um, for those who are frail, the heart rate goes up slower and the amount of changes would be smaller. Um, so we always think about heart rate uh, going up as a negative thing, like uh, it's kind of associated with the uh, stress. Um, but it ham it, for, for our kind of study, it shows the physiological reserve. If a person doesn't have the physiological reserve, the heart rate cannot go fast, cannot go up fast, and it cannot go up very much. So that's the whole hypothesis we are using here. And we saw that in our group of participants, uh, that's something that we observed. So we, we extract these features, again, um, timing of heart rate, how it goes up, how much it goes up, um, do some exponential analysis to see what are the time frame of the heart rate going up and down and doing the recovery. But we also did some uh, uh, machine learning and AI projects we use the, the raw signal we get from the heart rate and put it in our model. We use uh, LSTM and see if we can predict the outcomes without extracting any features. And we saw that we can get uh, better accuracy when you do use this method. So what, what we use was 20 seconds of baseline, just person resting, doing nothing, and then person doing 15 feet of walking, and then after that, the recovery. And using that simple data, we saw that we could get a very good accuracy of 0.88 um, using this uh, sample of data. So um, the heart rate dynamic concept has not been used a lot uh, because measuring heart rate is not very straightforward. The motion artifact can influence the result. Now we want to use this method for our operational meter test. There are some advantages because the person performed the physical task on the right side and we measure the heart rate on the left side. So there's gonna be minimum motion effect there. And we developed this code that can automatically identify when the person is doing the task and um, do the peak detection. The QRST and detect the peaks. And you can see if one peak is missing, because of the motion artifact, then it's going to influence the whole study, whole uh, basically the sequence of heart rate that we're, we're measuring here. Uh, so this we did it on the, we implemented this methodology and these measures for the arm test, and we saw you can see in this graph there is very unique distinction between non-frail and pre-frail. So non-frail heart rate goes up a lot, and it goes up fast. For those who are frail, it, the changes are not too much. Some of it, it goes because the heart is actually in the resting state working hard. So there's not that much a reserve for it to go higher. Um, so we have this uh, score for motor function. Now we develop a score for cognitive function. In the next uh, step of this research, we are going to establish a score that represent the uh, uh, cardiac autonomic performance. So this is going to happen. Uh, we just received the funding for a, uh, four-year NIH grant to continue using this. Um, the targeted population for this study would be older adults with advanced heart disease. And the main goal is to see, we can develop a score that identify complication for therapy for advanced heart disease patients. So these are some results showing that how the heart rate differences would be um, across different frailty groups. So, um, I talked about all these things we do in the in the lab, um, but we're gonna go back again to the first uh, start point, starting point. Uh, we want to come up with something people use really, um, and then uh, get it out there. We have established this uh, motor task uh, for assessing frailty, and we know it works um, both in terms of term of uh, predicting outcome, but. Uh, the sensors are expensive. Like a motion set that you would use for this assessment would be $10,000. Another $1,000 for the ECG sensor and set it up, it would be difficult. 
Now, what we are doing is to implement all these measures in a smartwatch and smartphone. So we're working with the Arizona Tech Launch. We actually uh, completed this. Um, uh, I, I could show it to you if it was in person, but uh, um, this platform uh, works with Fitbit and uh, Android phone. Uh, and we finished both the front end and uh, back end. We get the information from gyroscope and the optical sensor from the Fitbit. We do the post-processing companion of the phone. Uh, and then again, eventually we can show the score for all different features on the phone and the, and the smartwatch. All parts of it is done. And now we are working to be able to save this in the cloud. So there's a lot of um, trial and error there. It was not very straightforward to be able to program uh, in the phone because of so many limitations, but we were eventually be able to um, do this and now it's working. Uh, the other part that I want to uh, explain before I finish the frailty assessment is uh, the concept of network physiology in aging and frailty. This is a pretty new concept, a lot of research going towards this, uh, not just for frailty and basically aging uh, in general. Um, the concept saying that um, we, we're measuring, in our example, we're measuring different performance for um, motor task, neuromuscular performance, brain function, and heart function. But it's not only about how these units work independently, but also how they're interconnected. Um, one system doesn't work properly, it would eventually influence other system. So what we are trying to do in this project is to look at the interconnection between the system. There are several different ways to do this, um, like Granger causality or time delay stability. But for our purpose that we are dealing with a non-stationary and non-linear data set, we are using the convergent class mapping. Uh, to summarize it in simple words, we are trying to predict one behavior from one system from the current state of the other system and the history of performance. So we saw that. Um, this is what I, we expected that the interconnection between the system would be compromised as the person getting frail. And that's what we observed in our study that um, frail participants, the communication between their heart response and their motor task is lacking. And that can be a very unique measure to see how these systems are interacting. So that's going to be um, a project that I'm going to do in the next five years, this is uh, supported by the NSF carrier that uh, we just got the notification for. So we are looking to not only develop a score for each of these uh, physiological system, but also looking at the interaction of that. Eventually all of these uh, would be merged into one test and um, with bunch of different sensor attached to the person and um, be done very quickly. All this measurement, we get diff several different score, but if you think about it, the testing would be the same thing that takes between uh, five minutes to seven, eight minutes. So that's the whole point to be able to um, do this test in the clinical setting. And at the end, I really wanna acknowledge all the people who helped me with these projects and all the graduate students, of course, they do all the work and the postdoc helping with this. Um, I'm done with the frailty part. Uh, there's a lot. Of, there's another project that I like to explain, uh, and I think we have uh, time for that. Um, so this is this project is uh, about fall rehabilitation. Um, we are focusing on muscle spindle stimulation for this, and um, just just to give some numbers, I'm pretty sure most of you are familiar with this topic and. The falls are primary cause of traumatic injury in older adults in the United States. One out of four person in over 65 years old would fall in a year, which would lead to 36 million falls in the United, only in the United States every single year. So it's always the issue and it will be issue. Uh, what we are dealing here is to look deeper to see uh, what is the main reason of this falling and what, what causes it. So tripping is the main leading cause to falls. And there's a lot of study going on for both assessment and training of muscle strength. But if you look at looking at the evidence, there's new studies show that 
delayed placement of the recovery leg or delayed moment generation in stance leg are the reason. So when we talk about timing, it's all about how we sense ourselves in the environment. So that goes back to the perceptive performance. And that's where we are focusing in this uh, set of research. Um, we are trying to understand the performance of muscle spindles and somehow improve its performance. So uh, muscle spindles, in the, uh, they're, they're, they're the units responsible for measuring, the, for sensing the, the amount of muscle stretch and the velocity of muscle stretch. They work to a short latency by the reflexive responses and long latency uh, to going through the nervous system through a closed loop so we can um, basically perform the recovery when we encounter obstacles, doing walking, going up or down the stairs and different physical activity. Well, what happens when people get older, there are uh, decline in neurofibers and demyelization, which eventually change the sensory performance for every sensory unit and muscle spinder would be part of it. Uh, what we are doing here is use the stochastic noise, the Gaussian noise on the muscle, so we can excite the muscle spindle. Uh, originally, we were testing this to see um, how this muscle spindle and how the performance would be different for healthy young, low fall risk, and high risk of fall. So this was very interesting that we saw for high risk of fall, that more likely developing some sensory deficits uh, we saw improvement when we applied this as stochastic stimulation. They could do time up and go and postural balance test easier. So the postural balance is simply the standing upright and we measure the amount of sway. And time up and go, uh, they have to get up from a chair, walk 10 feet and come back and sit on the chair. Uh, for some delicate activities like turning and sitting on a chair, these as stochastic stimulation were improving their performance. So now we want to continue this research. We had this platform. Um, it's basically a modified treadmill. Uh, we measure the kinematics using the motion sensor again. We have the accurate placement of these uh, sensors that uh, do the simulation. We're targeting uh, muscle that are responsible for the ankle and hip proprioceptive performance. And we also measure the EMG activity, uh, the muscle activity during this task. Um, so, of course, we have a platform, you can see it in this video, to make sure the participant won't fall. And then uh, treadmill would move fast, and then they have to recover. It's somehow mimicking a tripping behavior. Uh, but with this setup, we can accurately characterize the recovery performance based on the kinematics, how to do the stepping, what are the activities in the muscle, and based on that, we can categorize the recovery performance. Um, so we tested this on healthy young and older adults, and we saw that we really can influ influence the, uh, the recovery process by stimulating ankle and hip muscle. It was more prominent when we stimulate the ankle muscle for healthy young and more prominent when we stimulate the hip muscles, uh, which is what we expected. Now in the next phase, we have to use this uh, methodology um, for all the adults to see at high risk of fall, so we can see, we can improve their recovery performance. But what trick is there is to know who is developing proprioceptive deficits. There's a lot of controversial ideas out there, how we can accurately measure proprioceptive performance. What we are establishing in our lab is to come up with a new game. It's very simple. There's no much distraction, just the cursor going around and the person should follow this uh, by moving their foot as you were seeing in the video. And based on that, we can give a score that somehow represent their proprioceptive performance. That's a very hard word to say. Um, and the other way we are doing this is to measure the joint position sense. So basically what happened, we passively move a joint, which would be hip joint or ankle joint to a certain angle. And we ask the participant to replicate that angle again actively. And then based on that, we can get a good measure of the proprioceptive performance. So this would be defining the baseline and then based on seeing how and who can benefit from the recovery uh, by using this stimulation, we can define a baseline 
of the level of appropriate safety performance that can uh, potentially benefit from this kind of testing. We are doing some other research. I don't want to go to the details, but I just wanted to put it here. Um, uh, we, uh, we are working on a NIH Trailblazer uh, grant. We are working with people in electrical uh, department. Uh, we are trying to develop a, a radar system that can identify faults. Um, this will be a combination of uh, machine learning and uh, biomechanics approach so we can um, detect falls. The unique thing about this is that um, what you would see would be something like this, uh, a cloud of points. So with this, we can maintain the confidentiality of the participants. There's not going to be a video camera and we will not directly see what they're doing but we would be still able to detect if the fall is happening. Uh, so how this happened is we have to train our system to see based on those clouds that we observe to detect different physical activity. So what you see here on the left is what we get from the Kinect system, which is the ground truth, and what on the right side, what we get from our radar system. And we try to um, train the system to be able to detect several different physical activity. Um, this have, we again use the LSTM model to detect the joint, and then we use the forward kinematics to compare this joint motion and get the body segment position and compare that to uh, the gold standard, which is the Kinect system here. And of course, we uh, also tried the upper extremity test because I'm um, so invested with this test. Um, for this, um, what we are doing is to train system for different physical activity, like walking, sitting, squatting, laying on the, on the chair. And then all of a sudden we mimic some um, falling. Um, so uh, the graduate student you can see in this video, they do some walking, sitting on the bed and then falling down. And I promise we put a platform there to make sure the graduate student wouldn't get hurt. So everything is safe. Uh, and then based on that, we can detect some abnormal behavior that would be the falling. And we saw that using this training, we're just doing one participant now, but in the continuation, we're going to collect data from uh, at least 50 people to train the system to be able to accurately for different type of age, gender, and kind of disability, we'll be able to detect these falling events. So I don't want to go more into details. I just want to finish in 45 minutes, but I'm more than happy to explain any part of the research that. Uh, you are interested in. Again, thanks for all the collaborators and graduate students that do all the work for all, all these uh, modeling and computational development that they did. And the funding source that um, continuously funding this project through the past um, uh, six years. And thank you so much for listening to me. I guess I'll start. Uh, Nima, thanks. That was, uh, uh, you covered a lot in 45 minutes and uh, almost to the exact minute. Um, that the uh, that that uh, the treadmill fall test looked looked very natural. So <laughs> that natural environment. But um, no, just joking. Um, I, I'm curious. You know, so you're talking about you talked a little bit about interventions. Um, and I'm just curious uh, how you're thinking about um, with when you, as you're measuring these um, these values in a lab, and as you're transitioning um, your your data capture to more real world data, um, how are you beginning to think about um, interventions um, outside of sticking um, you know um, stimuli, stimuli on people's legs? I'm, I'm right. just curious. That's, that's an excellent question. Actually, um, when we want to start projects, we, we really uh, work with people to say if this, this would eventually be something they use because we don't want to come up with something being in the lab, yeah, good for research, but eventually something that can be applied. So we were thinking a lot how, how we would eventually use this stimulation. So um, all we need actually is would be a programmable uh, actuator that can we, we can provide uh, uh, Gaussian noise and uh, it can be applied to the muscle. 
So uh, what we planning to do with this device in terms of getting it out there was uh, my, my thought process would be to get people involved in more um, in training. So most of people that can benefit from more aggressive the balance training are those who are either frail or they are in high risk of fall. So they can't even initiate this kind of training. So what we are targeting eventually is using these devices somehow improve the proprioceptive performance so they can get involved in the training and then we can see the long effect of how this training would be applied. So it would not be something that people wear 24 seven for sure. It would be something that they can wear to get involved in some training. And also they can maybe wear it at home if they wanna do some strenuous physical activity like cleaning the house, some tasks that they might put them in danger of falling, they can wear these devices. I, I hope I could answer the question, but if it's, it, it need more clarification, I would be happy to. Yeah, I, I like the way you're thinking about it, that it's not something that, uh, it's an all or nothing thing. Um, you can help people to understand what the risk is, and then they can you know, uh, weigh how important it is to add these, probably at least early on, inconvenient devices. Um, yes. But, uh, yeah. Yes. I have two questions. Uh, one is, I'm, I'm wondering why you chose radar for your experiment at the end where you were observing people fall rather than visible cameras. What, sorry, what was the other options? Uh, cameras, just regular cameras. So the, the regular, so the, this is actually a very good question. So um, the one problem with uh, the camera is people, we, we want to eventually use this in the nursing home. And uh, even with this radar, we, we're having some problem. People or pe like, they don't want to be monitored 24 uh, seven with the camera in their room. And initially we had the conversation with uh, some of our clinical advisor in the nursing home. And they basically straight told us no camera. They, if you want to put a camera in patient's room, they're not going to be agreed with it. They, what we're doing with this project is basically taking our data and show participants what we would see, like a cloud of points, not being able to detect uh, what the person is doing unless it goes through the uh, signal processing part so we can detect different physical activity. So I would say confidentiality is the main reason choosing radar. That's a great answer. Another uh, more obscure question is, if, if I understood correctly, you started out assessing the heart with EKG, but that's expensive and laborious to um, put on the patient. So you moved to the watch, which was you know a great answer. Um, there's a little known device called the seismocardiograph. It's extremely cheap. It's about $2 and it does a really good assessment of the heart and patients can wear it. They do. And I was wondering if you heard of it or thought of it or. I, I have not, but I would, I would definitely explore it. We're always okay. <laughs> excited to get like cheaper devices. The good thing about watch is very available. Like, uh, yeah, right. It'd be. <laughs> We had a hard time to work with Apple Watch um, because the developer options are not really available. But for Android and Fitbit, everything is out there and they have a very nice platform for the programming. Thank, but you. thank you for the advice. Any other questions? I guess as people are thinking of a, maybe a final question to ask, I have, I have one um, about intra-individual um, variability. So if you measure these tests a couple of times in the same person, are they like always consistent? Like does time of day make a difference when you're administering? Yeah, that's that's an excellent question. So what, what, what you're trying to do actually with our stress response test, to minimize those differences. Uh, to give you an example, so I was talking about the autonomic nervous system performance and uh, what, what commonly used is to look at the variability in the heart rate when the person is sitting down doing nothing. Um, 
what we observe, even if we do that different time of the day, that would change. So there's a lot of changes between subjects, of course, and then um, at the time of the measurement. So if what we are trying to do is to um, do a stress test that is defined, the duration is defined, and the act that they have to do is defined, and then based on that, um, look at the heart rate changes. But we always, the, the um, test retest reliability is the first thing we always do if we introduce a new outcome to see how it works. It's the same story for brain function assessment. Um, what we get from the cap, it's going to be very different uh, for today's session compared to the same testing we do on the person tomorrow. So that's why in our approach, we are looking at the patterns. So the complexity measure is basically looking at the patterns of how the signal changes, not necessarily the absolute value of the signal. And with that, we got very good. We actually tested this on 10 subjects, doing it two weeks apart. Uh, we got a very good ICC values of more than 0.8, which was very above like what we get just looking at the absolute value of the brain function activity. So it looks like this. Oh, yeah, we finally figured out how to unmute the conference room. <laughs> um, yeah, so I was interested in, you know, as you think about the last part of your presentation, how that would get incorporated into a workflow, like the fall, how the fall detection gets incorporated into a workflow. Are you imagining there's automated processing that like triggers an alert or how does that, how does that work? The, this would inform the nurse and the clin clinical staff that we would have basically this, this um, platform would be installed in every single room. It can in, be installed in the room, but it can also detect the area. The good thing about this radar, if the person even be behind the wall, we can still detect it. So they can cover the room and the bathroom. So bathroom is the critical place because a lot of falls happen there. But with this radar, we can cover that area. Uh, so this would inform the, the, the clinical staff if, if a fall happens. Uh, we are working towards predicting if the fall is happening, but that would be very tricky. And there's a lot of, you know, confounding variable would be get involved if you want to predict who is going to fall. At this stage of the project, uh, this would be just telling that the person, the fall is happening. It's for detecting that the fall is happening. Uh, did could I answer the question or is it okay? <laughs> Got it. Thanks. We have time for maybe one more question. So if not, we should uh, thank Dr. Tu today. Um, so thank you very much. It's a nice presentation. Thank you so much. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much.